All right, uh, well, as you know, we're pretty well into the study of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Um, each, each time I start, I do want to review a little bit of what we've seen just to kind of get us back up to speed, but I probably won't be able to review everything. Uh, just again, real quickly, we've seen that the Holy Spirit is a person and that he is a divine person, that is, he is one of the persons of the triune God. He is a distinct person from the Father and the Son. Now, we looked at the doctrine of the Trinity, and then we also saw what it was that distinguishes him from the other persons. The fact that he is called the Spirit of God is, uh, well, we believe that the Lord is communicating something to us about himself when he, one of the persons calls himself the Father, one calls himself the Son, and the other calls himself the Spirit. Now, we did see that the Spirit, the thing that perhaps mm, sets him apart from the others is that he is, in Scripture, called the love of God. Uh, we saw that that may have something to do with the love that the Father and the Son have uh, for one another, uh, their love, as it were, expressed and breathed out through all eternity uh, is what the Spirit of God is, although he is a separate person and he is, uh, uh, again, he is God. Now, uh, if, if we just set that aside and remember that the fruit of the Spirit is love, that that is the main thing that he produces in our hearts when he saves us, how he turns us from darkness to light, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light is he simply puts the love of God in our hearts. He makes us love God and uh, love him mainly because of his holiness. And that holiness is God's absolute love for what is good and right. When we love God for that reason, we are saved. We are born again. We have the spirit of God working uh, in our hearts uh, in a saving way. Now again, one thing we didn't uh, really mention too much about is the fact that <clears throat> when the Spirit of God actually um, uh, makes us alive, when he causes us to be born again, he plugs us into uh, Jesus Christ. He unites us with Jesus, with what we call a legal um, bond, so that uh, everything that Jesus did uh, on the earth, all of his perfect obedience <clears throat> is given to us as a free gift so that we are said to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. All of our sins, which Jesus, when he died on the cross, died for, all of our sins are taken away at that moment so that we have no imperfections and we are clothed in his perfect righteousness and we are made acceptable in Jesus Christ. Now again, the Spirit of God, when he plugs us into Christ, what he does is he causes us to believe on the Lord Jesus, to, to trust him, um, which means not just knowing the facts or believing that the facts are true, but we actually rest our whole hope of heaven on Jesus and him alone. That's the reason why we believe we're going to go to heaven. It's not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. Now, we haven't been focusing so much on that, but that is the gospel, but we've been focusing on the effects the Spirit of God actually produces in our lives. That which creates the faith, okay, is that love that he puts in our hearts. And basically that love is his nature. He is the love of God. He unites himself to our souls. He dwells in our souls, which is the spiritual part of us. And he begins to produce his nature inside of us. He begins to basically make us like Jesus, transforms us into his image. Jesus loved the Father more than any other. His meat and his drink was to do the will of the Father. That's what the Spirit of God produces in us. Now, we've been looking at the fact that Jesus basically was what he was because of the Spirit's work in his life. Remember that um, the Spirit of God was the one who conceived the human nature of Jesus Christ in the womb of the Virgin. One thing that Jonathan Edwards pointed out, whatever the Spirit of God creates must be holy. And that's what Jesus Christ uh, was and is. He is absolutely holy, which means without spot or blemish, without any sin. 
but also with a heart that perfectly loves God. Um, we didn't mention this before, but um, there, there, there is one thing that um, the Roman church believed was necessary in order for Jesus to be holy, and that is that, that the Virgin Mary herself be absolutely holy. Now, they don't actually explain how she becomes holy with an unholy mother and father, as far as I understand, but I don't think you need to have a succession of, of absolutely perfect or holy people to have a perfect human nature in Jesus Christ. All you need is the Holy Spirit to work as he did, uh, taking the place of the human father. Uh, he, he, as it were, um, you know, creates that, uh, takes, well, he really takes from the substance of Mary so that Jesus would be a part of the human race. And he basically supplies that which the Father would have supplied, only what he supplies, of course, is absolutely holy. So Jesus is truly the Son of Man. He is a part of the human race. But he is not sinful because he doesn't have the sin that comes down through Adam. If he had had a human father, Adam's sin would have been credited to him as it was to the rest of the human race. So the fact that the Holy Spirit creates this... Um, uh, human nature of Christ in the womb of the Virgin is what causes Jesus to be absolutely holy. And then we also notice that Jesus was anointed with the Spirit above measure. Um, again, the technical aspect of it is that uh, Edwards believes that that's how the person uh, in the human nature was identified with the divine person. But regardless, Jesus is anointed with the Spirit. The Spirit is the love of God. Jesus is filled with that love and that love of holiness, and he goes about doing all that God would have him to do. Now, the point we've been drawing from that is that when the Spirit of God works in a believer, when he works in you and in me, if you're trusting Jesus, he's working in you in the same way that he works in Jesus Christ, except, of course, not the virgin conception and so forth, or the virgin birth, but working that nature, that love of holiness within our hearts. Several parallels are drawn in Scripture between what was true of Jesus and what is true of us. Uh, the Bible says that uh, Jesus is the temple of God, for instance. Remember, he said to the Pharisees, destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it. And they said, well, it took, you know, X number of years to build this, and you're going to raise it up in uh, three days. And, and John says he was speaking of the temple of his body, that uh, Jesus is the true temple of God. But when we trust in Jesus and the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we become the temple of God, as we've seen. Uh, Jesus is the image of God, the exact representation of his nature. He is the one who um, explains God, the one who is God, who became man, and who reveals to us the Father. And yet, the Bible says, when the Holy Spirit is living in you, he's producing that same image in you so that you're becoming like God, not in the sense that you'll be almighty or eternal or all those other types of attributes that are only true of God, but that his moral likeness is in you, that love of holiness. That's what Peter means when he says we become partakers of the divine nature. It's not that we're becoming God in, that, in the sense that uh, he is, you know, the, the, uh, the creator and we're the creature, but rather we share that same love for what is good and right. Uh, Jesus had the law of God written upon his heart. His law, God's law was in his heart and Jesus fulfilled it. The Bible says the same thing is true of you. In the new covenant, the spirit of God takes the commandments of God and he writes them on the fleshly tablets of your heart, giving you a love for the law of God, and the ability actually to keep it. And so as Jesus walked perfectly according to the commandments of God, well, we walk according to the commandments. Uh, the Spirit of God is a principle within us. A, um, uh, he's that working force that causes us to go the right direction. However, we don't live perfectly as Jesus did. We still have sin in our hearts, and so we still sin. Uh, however, we have a love for what is right, and we want to go that direction, though we do stumble frequently because of our sins. And then finally, we saw that as Jesus obeyed the Lord with pleasure, it was his delight to do the will of God, so you do too if you have the Spirit of God within you. John tells us the commandments to the Christian are not burdensome, 
And the reason is because you love those commandments because the Spirit's written them on your heart. You want to do those things, so they're not a burden. It's not a burden to do what you want to do. It's only a burden to do what you don't want to do, right? So the Lord takes the burden of that away by giving to us a love for those things. And I believe that that's what Paul meant when he says in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 through 18, uh, that is that he was referring to the fact that the Spirit of God is transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. He says this, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit of God dwelling in us is changing us from one level of glory to the next into the image of Jesus Christ, who is the image of the Father, uh, who is that you know, perfect image of the Father. And um, again, it, basically what's happening here is that the Lord is fulfilling uh, the promise that he made to Jesus Christ, that if Jesus would, in fact, come into the world and redeem this people, that the Father would make them like Jesus and would adopt them into his family. Uh, that's what Paul has in mind when he says, for those whom he foreknew, that is the Father, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son so that he, that is Jesus, would be the firstborn among many brethren. So he doesn't just take a bunch of sinners and leave them as sinners and say, okay, here, Jesus, here are your brethren, a bunch of sinners completely unlike you. But he says, I'm going to redeem these people. I'm going to sanctify them. I'm going to make them holy by the, by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to make them like you, and they will literally be your brethren. Uh, and he'll adopt them into the family, and so we will share that same image, that same character, that same desire that Jesus has. Now, last time we, we saw that uh, the Spirit of God was at work in Jesus' life to call him to his ministry and to guide him through his ministry. And in the same way, he's involved in our lives to do exactly the same thing. Although, again, you know, uh, realizing that it's in a much greater way in Jesus' life, but he still uh, does these things in our lives as well. Uh, he says in Isaiah 42, the Old Testament prophet looking forward to Christ, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. In other words, the Father issues the call to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by his Spirit as to what he will do with his life to glorify God. And as he's going through uh, this work, he also guides him day by day. Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 5. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Again, reflecting you know, the Lord Jesus Christ and what he would do and his perfect obedience to the Father. But the Father would lead him by the Spirit of God, and he would obey. As we see in Matthew 4, 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So the Father puts the Spirit of God into Christ's heart and gives him a desire for this work that he's called him to. And he leads him all along the way, but again, his delight is always to do the will of the Father. Again, that's the Spirit's work, to give us a delight in these things. And again, that's what he does in us. He also calls us. I mean, he not only calls you into Christ's kingdom. It's the work of the Holy Spirit actually to take the gospel and make it effective in your life to call you into life, basically to raise you from the dead, to call you into the kingdom, and to call you into service. And not only to call you to salvation, which is again what makes the gospel to be powerful and saving, but also to that particular thing that you will do with your life to glorify him. Uh, the Father has a plan for you. He has you know, his, his will, and the Spirit of God will reveal that will to you. 
So we read in Acts 13, 2, for instance, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then David writes in Psalm 143, teach me to do your will for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Now again, the spirit of God calls you into the kingdom. He calls you to that particular job that you're going to do, that particular work for him. Uh, and again, that doesn't necessarily have to be within the church. It's in society. It's in the world. It may be the job that you're doing or it may be something else the Lord calls you to, and it can change. But he does call you, and he gives you, of course, we're going to see this tonight. He's going to, he gives you gifts that will enable you to do it. He gives you the power to be able to, um, to do it. But the way he calls you, and um, the way he guides you is not exactly the way it was with Jesus, but he's still very active. He doesn't speak to you verbally. Um, I think Jesus knew exactly what the will of the Spirit was because he had perfect communication with him. Uh, we don't have it like that, but we do know that he communicates. He communicates to us by opening and closing doors. You know, this is an open door he sets before us, which no man can close, and we can go through that door. Or he closes a door that no man can open. And so we can't go that particular direction. Uh, he gives us particular opportunities, you know, maybe um, an opportunity to serve him in a particular way. Again, that might just be considered another open door. Uh, he uh, certainly directs our hearts by giving us a desire to do this or that. But the primary way the Spirit of God guides us is through the word he inspired. And basically, the, the, uh, the work of the Spirit in guiding us in the word is called his work of illumination. He gives us a love for the word, a desire to read it. He, he helps us understand it, and he helps us apply it. Uh, so this is the main way the Spirit of God directs us. I think a number of Christians are looking for the, the providential open and closed doors. They're looking for the, the leading in their hearts and so forth. But really, this is the main way, which is why you need to read it. And you read the Bible and pray that the Spirit of God would show you what it means and how to apply it to your life so that when you're faced with a situation, just, Lord, what would you have me do in, in a circumstance like this? He often does bring to your remembrance a word of, you know, some scripture in, you know, a verse in scripture, and you say, ah, perfect, just what I needed to know. Now I know what he wants me to do. Now give me the strength to do it. Sometimes it's not easy to do what we're supposed to do, but I think he will always show us what the right thing to do is. Now this evening we want to look at the fact that he not only calls and he not only uh, guides, but he also gifts or equips and he empowers for service. And again, he, he did exactly the same thing in the case of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now maybe... At this point, I can get some involvement from you so you don't all fall asleep out there. Uh, let me uh, assign some scriptures, okay? And if you have a Bible, anybody? Uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just ask for a volunteer. John 3.34, a passage we keep coming back to. I'll let uh, Donna read that. And then Matthew 12, 27 and 28. Um, I'll tell you what, Rebecca, why don't you take that one? Sarah, why don't you take Hebrews 9 verses 13 through 14. Okay, now basically we're looking at uh, how Jesus was equipped to do the work that the Lord called him to do uh, in the world, in the work of redemption. And really, you can divide the work that Jesus Christ did into three categories. His work as prophet, his work as priest, his work as king. And everything revolves around that. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll look a little bit at that. But as, as a prophet, he came to declare to us God's will. Now, he's the greatest of all prophets. He is like the, uh, well, you say the archetype or the, uh, uh, what all the prophets were pointing to. He is the, the, the greatest. He is, um, again, the one that uh, speaks the word of God because he is the word of God. But now the, the question is, how was he able to speak the word of God as he did? John 3.34.
get. And so the, the point is, how was he able to do what he did? Yeah, notice it says that he whom God sent, and that's referring to Jesus, speaks the words of God. Why? Because he, that is the Father, gives the Spirit to him without measure. And so the Spirit of God was the one who empowered Jesus Christ to preach the Word of God as he did. Now, one of the things that Jesus also did, well, let me ask you this question. What did Jesus do in order to prove that the word that he was speaking was actually the word of God. How did he prove it? What's that? He did signs. Okay. He did signs, miracles, and wonders. And by the way, I should uh, point out, I was just have, talking to somebody about this the other day, the one thing about the miracles that Jesus did and the miracles that um, the apostles did is that when they did it, it, it stopped traffic. And everybody, you know, just was, was amazed at what they saw. And they felt a sense of fear inside of them. Uh, because the purpose of it, okay, the purpose of the miracle was actually to instill fear in them. So that they know, would know that God is present. And that the word that was being spoken was actually God's word. Okay. Now, let me just say this. That um, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Um, uh, I was in uh, a church that believed in miracles. It was, uh, you know, the full gospel type church. And I was in that church for several years. And then I went to another church that was more mildly charismatic that also believed in miracles, but wasn't quite the same. But all during that time, especially when I was in the full gospel church, and I saw all these claims that were being laid for this miracle and that miracle, and people were being healed and so forth, in that whole course of time, and I even asked the person I was speaking to who was in that church many more years than I was. I said, D can you th think back and identify one miracle that you saw that you knew was a miracle and that created fear and awe and all this you know, type of thing that miracles should create? And actually, she said no. And as I look back at my own experience, I didn't see anything either. And yet all of us there believed miracles were going on all the time. Well, these were not the same miracles that the Lord was doing in the, old, well, in, in the uh, biblical times when these miracles were actually being done because those miracles would, would amaze you. I mean, they would, they would strike fear into your heart because they showed the power of God. There was no mistake. Only God could do that kind of a miracle. So those people, you know, they, they trembled because they knew God was present because of what they saw. And what I saw was nothing. I didn't see anything happen. And those are the types of miracles that often happen today. I'm not saying that God can't do miracles, but I am saying that most of these people, all these people who actually who are claiming to perform miracles are not performing miracles. Okay, but now the question is how did Jesus do his miracles? And here's the, the one passage in Matthew 12, 27 through 28. Okay, so what was Jesus saying was the power by which he cast out demons? Okay, through God, but by the Spirit of God, right? And not by the devil. Now, again, casting out a demon, that was a miraculous thing uh, because, uh, you know, the demons were possessing people and making them behave in a very destructive way. And when the Lord set them free, for the people who knew that demon-possessed person, they saw something that made them afraid. Here was a power greater than Satan's when the demon was cast out and the person was again put into their right mind. But Jesus did that miracle as well as the other miracles by the Spirit of God. Now Jesus as priest offers a sacrifice for sins that takes away sin, something that animal sacrifices could not do. And he did that through the sacrifice of himself. But the question is how did he sacrifice himself? Where did he get the power uh, to do that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. And 
so how was he able to make that sacrifice? Okay, through the eternal spirit and the, um, it's referring to the Holy Spirit. So again, all that Jesus did with regard to his prophetic work and with regard to his um, uh, priestly work, he did through the power of the Holy Spirit. And actually, we didn't get to see too much of his kingly work on earth, although um, we did see something. He commanded demons and they obeyed him. That certainly shows authority. And uh, now that he is ruling, of course, uh, in heaven, uh, he is exercising complete authority over heaven and earth, over every power, every uh, principality, as the Bible says. And uh, he is aware of so many different things that are going on that he's in absolute control. Nothing happens outside of his will. And the question is, how is he able to do that? Well, again, I don't have a specific text for this one, but I do believe it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, in the Old Testament, whenever a prophet or a priest or a king was uh, put into office, they were anointed with oil. And uh, that, that was their anointing for service. And what did the anointing with oil actually represent? The anointing of the Holy Spirit to give them the power to do the work the Lord was calling them to do. They could not do it apart from the Spirit. As a matter of fact, when Saul was anointed king and the Spirit of God came upon him, he became another man. He had a power and an authority that he didn't have before. Now he acted like a king, although sadly it was a wicked king. <laughs> uh, Saul did not believe um, was the Lord's, but uh, David certainly uh, was. But they were only able to do what they did by the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, Jesus in his offices is anointed with the Spirit above measure in order to do the things that he did. Now, again, the point is that the Spirit of God in, uh, equipped Jesus to do the things that he was doing. And so Jesus, you know, the, there's the image in the Old Testament of the, the priest as he's being set aside for office. And one of the things they did, which kind of makes us cringe, especially in a, in a society where we like clean hair, <laughs> they would take uh, oil and dump it on his head. And the oil would run down his head and run down his beard and run down his garments and just drip off, you know. And it, was, it seems kind of messy. And yet it was a great blessing for the priest to be able to receive this, and it was a picture of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, the interesting thing is this idea of it going from the head and flowing down the robes and over his body is also a picture of what would happen when Jesus would receive the Spirit of God for his church. He's the head and we're the body. He receives the spirit and it flows through him to every member of his body, giving them, uh, really equipping them to do the work that we are supposed to be doing for the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. When the Bible says that we are the body of Christ, it doesn't simply mean that, um, you know, we're a part of, um, of the saved and uh, like a temple and so forth, that, that imagery has some kind of meaning. And the meaning is that even as we use our bodies to accomplish the work that, that we do in this world, as the body of Christ, we are to be doing what Jesus wants to accomplish in this world. So the anointing of the Spirit is to empower his body, which is us, to equip us and to empower us to do what the Lord would have us do for him in the world. Does that make sense? All right. So now what does the Lord give to us in order to equip us? He certainly gives us his Holy Spirit. And what does the Spirit give us that, that uh, enables us or equips us to serve him in this world? Okay, the Spirit of God, of course, is absolutely essential. He gives to us, you know, desire to serve the Lord, but what else does he give to us along with that desire? Gifts, gifts that's right, gifts. We've been talking about yeah. gifts, haven't we? And gifts are very important. And perhaps we could all turn up Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. And here, simply is referring to the fact that when our Lord Jesus Christ ascended, the imagery that's used in that passage is of 
a uh, conqueror who has just come from his conquest, and he enters back into his home city, and there's like this parade and procession, and one thing that uh, the conqueror would do would be to, uh, to celebrate his victory, he would give gifts. In this case, as our Lord Jesus Christ ascends into heaven, the gifts that he gives are uh, to his church in the form of spiritual gifts to help them do the work. Remember that Jesus ascended before he sent the Spirit 10 days later on the day of Pentecost to empower and equip and gift his church. Now, after speaking of that imagery, it talks about what some of those gifts are, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now, I want you to notice right there, though, that this isn't all the gifts, but here are some specific gifts that were given in order to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And it also talks about, again, what we've been looking at, uh, what it is that a mature man looks like, what it is that we are to be growing into, whose likeness, it says, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So again, purpose of the gifts is, at least some of these gifts, is to mature us and to make us more like Jesus Christ. Now, what are we supposed to do with, with this, gift, this giftedness or this uh, maturity? As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now here I think that the main focus is on the health of the body itself. Uh, as these gifts are being exercised and as every part of the body is doing what it needs to do, the, the body is, is growing into the image of Jesus Christ. But let's not forget that that's not an end in itself, although it is an important end, but it's a means to an end as well. And that end is that the work that Jesus wants to be done on earth will be done. It will be done by those who are growing into his likeness and image. It will be done by his body, the church, as we continue to grow. Now, again, I mentioned that there are other gifts that the Spirit of God gives. And in Scripture, it says he gives each of us gifts to equip us. Uh, so there are, there are gifts that... that are given to others to equip each one of us, but then there are gifts given to us that we use to minister to one another. Um, and actually, why don't we turn up this passage, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11. There's actually a couple of passages in Scripture that contain lists of gifts. And I, I did hear, um, it was actually uh, Joey Piper who um, said this, that the list given to us in 1 Corinthians 12 is basically a list of the charismatic gifts, the gifts that no longer exist. And we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But then there's a list given in Romans 12 that uh, continue. So uh, let's, first of all, look at the list of charismatic gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11. Now, there are varieties of gifts but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another, the effecting of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, the distinguishing of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. 
But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Okay. But the point is the Spirit of God gives to each person. Okay. I, I didn't see the things that, that funny here, but okay. But he gives to each person okay, a particular gift that we are to use to build up one another. Right? Now, as I mentioned before, this may very well be a, a list of charismatic gifts, although you might say, well, is the gift of faith a charismatic gift? It depends on what that faith is exercised toward. If it's the faith to believe that uh, the Lord is going to do a particular thing, answer a particular prayer, and so forth, perhaps, maybe it's not all neat and tidy. But one thing we do want to bear in mind is that the gifts that um, we call charismatic gifts such as knowing things you couldn't know otherwise unless the Lord revealed it to you, or prophesying forth, uh, foretelling what's going to happen in the future. Uh, things of that nature, tongues, miracles, uh, the ability actually to perform a miracle on the spot, as it were, uh, to have that ability. Uh, those miracles or those particular gifts are believed to have... Um, uh, passed away with completion of the canon, that is, once the scriptures were completed, and what God had said was verified through the miracles that were performed by those writing and proclaiming this word, once this was complete, the Bible was complete, there was no longer a need to authenticate the word because it had already been authenticated. Uh, during the, the time of the Protestant Reformation, when um, you had the... Um, you know, the, the Protestants and you had the Roman Church and so forth, they, they were, of course, arguing back and forth. We still do that today. Um, but one thing the Roman Church believed was that, uh, that miracles were still being performed and that um, if there was a miracle associated with a person while he was alive, that that person could perform a miracle. Or after he was dead, if some remnant or relic of his body uh, actually a miracle was associated with that, then that person would be believed to be a saint. Um, and anyway, there were miracles that were going on, at least the Roman church believed that there were miracles, but the Protestants didn't believe that miracles continued. And so one time, and I, I'm not sure exactly who the person on the Roman side was who said to John Calvin, they, they said, we believe, but we believe because we have miracles. The Lord is, is working among us, we have these miracles, and, and so we believe we have the truth. So. Why do you believe you have the truth? Where are your miracles? John Calvin picked up his Bible and he says, the miracles are in here. You know, the Lord has already authenticated his words and we accept those miracles to authenticate this truth and this is the truth we believe. Okay? Not extra truth, not additional truth, but just what God has verified in his word. So again, there's different beliefs regarding whether the miracles continue or not, but our belief is simply this, that these miracles were given to authenticate the word, and once the word was complete, the miracles were no longer necessary. So then, are there gifts that continue that the Spirit of God gives to us to equip us for work? Well, yes, there are, just not these particular gifts. I mean, we don't, um, we don't stop and pray during a service and say, Lord, give us a word and, and then somebody prophesies and speaks directly from the Lord or somebody speaks in tongues or something like that. Uh, what we do is we open up the Bible, we read, we, we um, uh, interpret and apply. Um, that is another use of the gift of prophecy, which is a, uh, not a foretelling the future, but a forthtelling what has already been uh, uh, given by the Lord. And actually, that, I, I say that just to uh, sort of preface the next list of gifts, which is in Romans chapter 12. Perhaps we could turn that up real quick. Okay, Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, 
for he who teaches in his teaching, for he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So again, here's another list of gifts. And again, as I mentioned, if you would take these to be non-charismatic, the, the, the prophecy here then would be the preaching of the word of God and not a, a foretelling of the future, but rather a forthtelling or declaration of what the Lord has already uh, given to us in his word. Uh, the Puritans very strongly believed that, that prophecy in the sense of foretelling the future was no longer given by the Lord. And yet one of the, um, uh, you'd say the architects of the, uh, of the Puritans, uh, William Perkins, wrote a book called The Art of Prophecy. So did they believe in continuing prophecy or not? Well, actually not in the sense of foretelling the future, but in the sense of declaring God's word because the book is actually a book on preaching how to prophesy in the Lord's church, uh, how to preach, in other words, okay? But again, the point is that the Spirit of God equipped Jesus Christ to do the work that he did. As we saw, he did everything that he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit gives to the different members of the body of Christ gifts so that they can do the work that Jesus wants them to do on earth as his body. Again, Jesus, is, is bodily, he is physically in heaven. We are on earth and we are those who do then the will of our head who is in heaven on earth. So again, the Spirit of God gives us these gifts. And when you think of it in terms of his nature, think of it in these terms, he gives us the gifts by which we might love God by serving him. And he gives us gifts by which we might love our brethren by serving them. So again, the, the whole purpose behind it is love, that we might love our head, that we might love the members of his body uh, in serving them and in serving others. Now we're just about out of time, um, and since this is a part of what we're talking about, let me just try to kind of go through this quickly. He equips us and he empowers us. He also gives us strength and he gives us desire. Let me just read a passage here, Acts 10, 38, uh, where, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of, oh, this would have been, I think, Peter speaking to Cornelius and his household. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So again, the Father anoints Jesus Christ and empowers him to do his work by the Holy Spirit. The Lord also gives us his spirit to give us power. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And then one other instance in Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So what now, what is this power as over against the gifts? Well, this power is, is part of that equipping, you, you, he gives you gifts, but he also gives you power or strength, ability to use them. I mean, actually two people can have the same gift, but one of them who has more of, the, of this power of the Holy Spirit will be able to do more with that gift than the person who has less of it. And so exactly what, what is this power? Maybe it's kind of hard to put our, our finger on it, but I think in terms of what the Spirit of God does, he gives us the desire to serve him. He gives us a single heart. You know, as long as you have a divided heart between the Lord and something else, you're going to have a hard time doing everything the Lord calls you to do because this other thing is going to constantly be draining you, drawing your attention away and your heart away. A person who has a single heart is a person who is able to do more. And the Spirit of God gives you that single heart. He gives you that ability to press forward, you, I mean, you know when your, your affections are set on something, 
that you go that direction. Your heart won't let you do otherwise. Well, that's what the Spirit of God does. He gives us the ability to move forward. He gives us a great love and desire and zeal. You know, when affections are stirred up to a high level, we call that zeal. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the Lord has redeemed us, that we might be zealous for good works or zealous to do the work that Jesus wants to do through his body with the gifts that he has given to us. So basically what we see here is that in the same way that the Spirit equipped Jesus, he equips us. In the same way that he empowered Jesus, he empowers us. And because of that, it's very important to bear in mind what we've seen in the Sunday evening messages, that we do not quench the Spirit, that we do not grieve the Holy Spirit, because when he is quenched and when he is grieved, our ability to serve him is severely weakened because it causes our desire to grow less. We become, well, weak in our hearts. We just don't want it as strongly. The Spirit of God will give us a greater desire to do what the Lord calls us to do. And the stronger that desire is, the more we'll want to do it. And the more we want to do it, the more useful we'll be. So the point again is, this is what the Spirit does. So let's stay away from the things that pour water on the Spirit and weaken His influence in us. It doesn't weaken Him. It just weakens the influence that He has inside of us, in our souls. We want to strengthen that. We want to uh, stoke that fire, and we don't want to put it out. And again, sin is what puts it out. Sower doesn't put it out, but weakens it. Can't, can't really put it out if, if the Spirit of God is working in you in a saving way. But... Um, the means of grace, which would be reading the Word of God, praying, fellowshipping, all of these things that, uh, you know, the, the Lord's table, the Word of God, preaching, teaching, you know, hopefully we've gained something of His help just by participating in the study, understanding more of what God's will is and having it imp applied to us. It's, it's one of the ways the Spirit of God strengthens His work within us. Certainly gives to us a greater understanding of what He's doing so that we'll know what we need to do in order not to stop him, but rather to agree with him, to walk with him, to, uh, you know, to go that direction instead of the direction that we might otherwise go that will cause us to grow weaker. So, again, this is the Spirit of God's uh, work. We're talking about his work in this particular section. So, anyway, that's all I wanted to say this evening. Are there any questions, questions or comments? Did you say you had a question, Maria? Okay. Yeah, and that kind of fear you have to understand is is not like terror so that people run away, but it's it's like a reverence. You know how the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's this holy reverence, you call it a holy fear, which doesn't drive you away, but rather draws you in to respect who God is. Okay. Yes. So that's a, a great great point. And how can one hang on? What is to to show that we we have a testimony of how we came to be I mean why did he do why did we believe in the miracles were performed so that would influence the people at that time. Right and, and you'll Yeah, and you'll notice, too, in Scripture, for instance, uh, Jesus casts out demons, and then the, the leaders of Israel begin to accuse him of being in league with Satan. They not only don't fear God, but they recognize that really what Jesus said is true. Uh, if Satan is divided against himself, his kingdom can't stand. So Jesus could not have been doing this by the power of Satan. He had to be doing it by the power of the Spirit of God, and they saw that, and they knew that, and they knew he must be right, but they still accused him and rejected him and did not fear, which means their hearts were hard, and Jesus actually told them that um, they blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and by doing so, they've committed an unpardonable sin. But for the people who didn't have such hard hearts, when they saw it, they didn't have that reaction. They, they feared. I mean, they, they realized they were in the presence of God. It's kind of like when, when Moses saw the burning bush and he heard God speaking 
you know, it caused him to, to be afraid and, and to, uh, you know, to revere and, you know, to reverence the Lord rather than just to treat him as, you know, like this is no big deal kind of thing. It stops traffic and makes people realize that God is there. So they pay attention. <laughs> That's right. And it was also proving that he was who he said he was too, who is the, the Messiah and the only way of salvation. Now, I realize this could have gone by too quickly, so let me, let me just um, try to explain what I mean by that. God can and does do miracles today. But what I was saying was that the, the gift to perform miracles, I mean, the Lord had actually given to his disciples, for instance, the ability to perform miracles at will. You know, uh, when they went out preaching, he said, you know, as you preach, uh, heal the sick and raise the dead, you know. I don't think anybody has the power to do that today. I don't think God gives that ability, but it doesn't mean he can't do miracles or doesn't do miracles. He, he may in answer to prayer, or he may um, you know, simply heal whom he wills and so forth, but the people that claim to have that ability, I don't know if you're aware of, you've seen people on TV and so forth, um, and it's not just because I was in a ministry like that for several years where I didn't see anything going on. I mean, uh, you, you hear that miracles are going on. The pastor is saying miracles are going on. And yet you don't see anything. It, it's not the same thing that was going on in the Bible when they had the ability to do these miracles. Somebody who had leprosy whose flesh was literally rotting off their body suddenly became whole, you know. It's like, you know, you, you couldn't escape it. It happened. Or somebody who was dead was raised to life, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you can see it, and, and people, you know, were, were trembling at the fact that uh, God was present, but what you see in these other places is, well, you know, you have this warm feeling in your back, and something that was wrong in there is now being healed, and, you know, this type of thing where you don't see anything, uh, and again, I think there's, there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes there, You'd, we'd have to talk about that a little bit offline to get a fuller picture, but uh, anyway, that, that's what I mean. He's, he can and does do miracles, but he doesn't give men the ability to perform them at will anymore the way he did that. Were there any other questions or comments? We need to step back for prayer. Do you have any other questions, Maria? Or maybe we could talk about it afterwards if you want to. Okay, okay, good. All right, then, if there aren't any other questions, then why don't we have a word of prayer, and then let's try to... Uh, get back into the back for prayer as soon as we can because we're still going to end at 8.30, okay, re regardless of when we go back there. So uh, let's try to get there as soon as possible. Let's, let's pray.